Welcome to a very special event, the first Experts Roundtable presented by Axiom Space. In a very 2020 move, we're doing this virtually, but I think this will nonetheless be one of the more unique conversations I've certainly ever been a party to, and I hope you, the viewer, will feel the same. We're bringing together here four of the fewer than 600 people to have ever gone to space in human history to get the sort of unfiltered, down-to-earth perspectives from astronauts you'll not find anywhere else in the industry. With that said, let me introduce our roundtable participants. Michael Lopez Alegria, Axiom VP of Business Development, the American Spacewalk Hours record holder and former commander of ISS Expedition 14. Rex Walheim, Axiom's Director of Safety and Mission Assurance, whose three shuttle missions over a two-decade astronaut career included STS-135, the final flight of the shuttle. Peggy Whitson, two-time ISS commander and NASA's all-time leader in days spent in space. And Charlie Bolden, who flew on four space shuttle missions and served as NASA's administrator from 2009 to 2017. And my name is Bo Holder. I'm Axiom's Manager of Communications and your moderator today. Now, obviously, our respective involvements with Axiom are what brought us together on this occasion. So given that context, I'd like to each ask you for a summary of what made you want to get involved with what's happening here. And LA, I'll start with you. OK, thanks, Bo. Good to be with all of you. Um, this is a, a, a unique opportunity. I'm looking forward to this conversation. So I got involved with Axiom when it was uh, Axiom LLC, which was back in early 2016. Um, and I think the reason is twofold. I left NASA, I had left NASA a few years earlier and became involved in commercial spaceflight. And it's a bit of a difficult term to define, but it's uh, also known as new space companies. It's companies that are trying to do things in a little bit different way than what has historically been the case, particularly in human spaceflight. And Axiom represented a, uh, a new entry into that world of uh, low Earth orbit commercialization. And you know the second part was just relationships. I've known Mike Sefardini for a very long time, and uh, when he asked me to join the company, it was a no-brainer. So here I am. How about you, Peg? Well, I actually only started a, a couple of months ago, but some of the same things that LA talked about were consistent with my path as well. Uh, I also have had a long relationship with Mike Sefardini. And I really admire what Axiom's trying to do. And I think taking a lot of the lessons learned from things that we could have done better on the space station, uh, I think is a really smart way to do this. And so I'm excited to try and help out and provide my operational experience uh, to see if we can uh, refine it even further. So I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be really exciting. How about you, Rex? Well, for me, it was it was similar. You know, I've uh, been working at the Johnson Space Center for many years, and I was the last three years I was the director of safety and mission assurance. And uh, Axiom approached me about uh, uh, becoming the director of safety and mission assurance here, and so I thought it was a neat opportunity because I really enjoyed working with the commercial crew program and with the the companies that are making the new rockets and spacecraft to take crews to uh, the space station. And here was a chance to work on a commercialization of the space station. So it seemed like a neat opportunity to uh, to get involved with. So I was excited to join. Charlie. I guess if I would round it out, I'm, I'm like everybody. I, you know, I, as the NASA administrator, I'd worked very closely with Suff when he was running the space station program. And as we traveled around the world and talked about what after International Space Station, we kept trying to explain to other people in other countries who don't understand the term commercialize or commercial. Uh, and um, so Suff came in and told me he was going to leave the agency one day. And I said, why? He said, well, I want to go off and do some of this stuff that we've been talking about. I really want to, you know, start a space company that's going to help push commercial space. And so I, I encouraged him and waved goodbye, expecting that he'd come back, running back to us after a short period of time. But he went out and did exactly what he said. And it turned out to be Axiom. And uh, when I finally retired as the NASA administrator, I was having a lot of fun doing nothing. And I think it was actually LA that came and asked if I if I was interested in doing a little consulting for Axiom, uh, and that was right up my alley because I'm still trying to promote commercial space. And uh, Axiom is a leader. Um, they're doing all the kinds of things that we had talked about in making the transition, the gradual transition from life on the International Space Station where everything's run by governments to life in low Earth orbit where everything is under the control of the private sector supporting government. So um, that that's what Axiom has provided me an opportunity to do. 
You know, it's interesting. It strikes me that that seeing your three faces here, um, even though because of COVID, we probably haven't been in the same room, I'm guessing in at least a decade, right? The four of us. And uh, certainly not since we all joined the company. And yet it feels very familiar to be, quote unquote, hanging out with you guys like, you know, like it were just another day back in the office in uh, in CB, as we call it, in the in the astronaut office. And one thing that um, I think is something that I am hopeful spreads to our customers, both professional astronauts and private astronauts, is this sense of family, you know, that we have that you share so many meaningful experiences with each other that um, it just becomes, you know, like your family member, which is, it's great. I think another thing, you know, I, I was telling Peggy the other day how great it was to see her again. I have not seen Peggy in quite a while. And um, we go back probably farther than any of the rest of you because Dr. Whitson wasn't always an astronaut. Well, none of us were. But <laughs> I first met, it took me a little longer. <laughs> I first met Dr. Whitson when she was a tough principal investigator uh, for whom I was one of her guinea pigs on my very last space shuttle mission, STS-60, and we were doing a uh, it, it was a blood related experiment and I, I really fell in love with it like I generally tend to do about things that I, you know, that I, that I, I like. It, I was passionate because the, the experiment, you know, and I'm not sure how it ended up, but it had it, it portended of being able to help troops in the in the field when they needed blood, because what she was looking at was a, an, an ability. And you can correct me here, Peggy, because I'll get it all screwed up. But I, I, the way I understood it, she was looking at a way to, to, you know, take blood and put it into much smaller uh, storage capability. Like it looked like they were cards, pieces of cardboard. And and then uh, when you needed it, you take out one of those things, put a, I'll use the term solvent, which is probably a bad term to use. But anyway, you'd flush this stuff through and you ended up with whole blood again. And for me as a Marine, that was really, really, really exciting because I felt that Right out in space, I was doing something that was going to help my fellow Marines, sailors, soldiers, airmen, and all that stuff someday if they if they got to the point where they needed blood. Yeah, it was a lot of fun working with Charlie because, you know, besides he has a fantastic sense of humor, but uh, I also was in charge of the organizing all the space uh, science on that landing day. And the funniest thing ha that happened to us was that you know, we had to cut everything to fit within a very small window. And uh, somebody came in to say, well, you aren't going to be able to finish all these investigations. And Charlie came over to me and he put his head on my shoulder and he said, Dr. Whitson, why don't you tell them why they can't do that? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the neat things about being part of the astronaut family is we get to experience so much of life together and whether it's in the office and office setting whether it's flying in t-38s or flying in space together and uh, or just doing uh, various training events like i know uh, mike mike la and i you know we went on the uh, national outdoor leadership school training where they train you to work together as a team in outdoor activities what they're really trying to teach you is teach you how to cope with adversity and so they sent uh, mike and i up to uh, up to the uh, prince william sound in alaska where it's usually very wet and cold and rainy and you have to deal with all these all this adversity and it trains you how to how to deal with that and cope with it and uh one of the fun things about that trip though was we had probably the 10 best days of weather they've ever had in prince william sound so the things we had to cope with were too much salmon too much sun it was just absolutely incredible but it was it was a great experience to really get to know people and to, to get to know our future crewmates and other office mates it's, it's a neat part of being an astronaut being part of that family I wonder if you're going to come clean on that story, Rex, because that was nothing much more than a paid vacation. It was glorious. <laughs> it was. We tried to hide it when we got back, but it didn't work. You know, we had the picture to show it. You know, we had to show the the, the one and a half rainy days we had there. But other than that, it was it was pretty awesome. Yeah, it was great. Well, I think you you made up for it, LA, when we did our survival training in Russia. Uh, and it was winter survival, and so the Russians know how to do one thing really, really well, and that's winter. <laughs> and <laughs> we had a, we had the biggest snowflakes. I'm from Iowa, and but the biggest snowflakes you've ever seen in your life. They 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 fogged up the pictures. They looked so bad, but it made everything wet. They were these big, fluffy, wet snowflakes, and you know the first night 
we had to do build a little lean to and sleep up next to the capsule and we all froze to death so the next night LA or the next day LA and are working on the shalage it's a little tent like thing a little place we were going to live and uh, we were there with Roman Romanenko a cosmonaut who hadn't flown in space at that point in time either I hadn't flown but LA had and uh, we were going to build the five star shalage well we got because it was so wet the snow was so wet it was coming down while we're building this thing. We get inside, and as soon as our body heat starts warming it up, it starts raining inside the tent. Yeah. It was miserable. We were so convinced that we were going to have this Four Seasons kind of uh, lodging there because we had lined the outside of the tent with all these um, pine tree branches, which uh, theoretically would keep the heat in. What we didn't realize is that we had so much body heat that it would melt the snow that was attached to those branches and it went right through the fabric of the tent. It was literally raining inside the tent. It was miserable. <laughs> you and LA spent a lot of time in Russia training. And I, I'm not sure, Rex, because I was gone when you started doing most of your stuff. But the thing that um, that I'm curious about, you know, we're, we're here and we're very relaxed because we were trained to do this kind of stuff, to, to communicate with people. Um, do the Russians worry about that kind of stuff? Do they give you media training the way that, that they beat it into us in the astronaut office, you know, where you get in front of the cameras and stuff, or do they just let you go off and wing it? Uh, for uh, for them, no, we didn't do any media training. Um, you know, they do lots of other types of training, but uh, no no specific media training. They Obviously, they care about having their uh, cosmonauts go out and speak to school children just like we do. Um, but they, they don't have any specific training for us, at least not that they included us in, uh, right. LA did, you weren't included in any. Same. In fact, I didn't really see them the, uh, you know, once you're in training, whether you're a cosmonaut or an astronaut, you don't tend to do much media stuff except maybe right up to before the launch or something like that. But I didn't see too many of our colleagues get involved with doing interviews or anything like that. So I'm not sure it's, um, as common an activity for them to yeah. to engage with. <clears throat> but you, Charlie, you flew with the first uh, Russians on the space shuttle. And I remember, um, you know, when Sergei and uh, and Volodya came over to start training as prime and backup, respectively. It was interesting because, you know, they had come from very different backgrounds. Sergei is an engineer, Sergei Krikalov, by the way, and uh, Vla Vla Vladimir uh, Volodya Titov uh, was a, a Russian uh, fighter pilot, and uh, they sort of had very different personalities as well, right? They had totally different personalities. It began with the fact that, that Sergei was a fluent English speaker, uh, so he got along incredibly well and very easy going and everything. Volodya spoke not a word of English when he came, and, and I, I was impressed with the way that he went through training because everything he did, and he was, he was trained as a backup remote manipulator system arm operator and uh, which is pretty technical in and of itself and so he had to he had to learn how to operate the arm with somebody whispering over his ear you know in in russian to tell him what everybody what the instructors were saying and all that but he did he did a great job but you know it's it's interesting you say that when i was first offered the opportunity to fly the mission i i was stationed at nasa headquarters in washington i was working for aaron cohen as the assistant deputy administrator at the time uh, in Dan Golden's first year, and I really wanted to get back to D.C. to uh, Houston because I hated D.C. And George Abbey came in one day and said, "Hey, we want you to go back to Houston and and fly one more time. Would you be interested in doing that?" And I said, "Yes." What do you want me to do? And I was kind of hoping I'd get the the command the first Hubble um, re um, repair mission because we hadn't done that yet. He said, "No, that's already gone. We gave that to Cubby." I said, "Okay, what do you have in mind?" He said. Well, we've got these two Russian cosmonauts. I said, forget it. And of all people to tell you to calm down, George said, calm down. They're in town. <laughs> Why don't you have dinner with them tonight? Meet them. Donna and David Bartow, who I think we all know, uh, had them over to the house. And, and the, from the moment I walked in the door, we started talking about family. And, uh, you know, at the time, Sergei's daughter was Olga, who was four. Uh, Vladimir had an eight year old son, Yuri, and a 16 year old daughter, Marina. And uh, that's all we talked about all night was our families, what we wanted for the future of the world and, and the kind of world we wanted our kids to grow up in. And I went in the next morning and I said, OK, 
I'm all in. And it turned out to be the most fantastic two years I've ever had, training with them, flying, and then getting a chance to go visit Russia, though it very shortly in our post-flight stuff. Well, you all remember, you know, when you're uh, when you're in the newest class of astronauts, um, first as an ASCAN astronaut candidate, and then as an astronaut, you're responsible for putting on the Christmas kit, right? And so, one the year, I guess it must have been '95, maybe when uh, you started training. Maybe it was '94, Charlie, with that crew. So, um, one of our segments, which tended to be based on Saturday Night Live at the time was the wild and crazy guys. And uh, Scott Parazinski and Sergey were the uh, the wild and crazy guys. It was pretty funny. <clears throat> you know, that whole aspect of international cooperation on on the space program is is really one of the, my favorite memories of, of the program, just how we've been able to cooperate with the Russians, like uh, Charlie mentioned. But, you know, just to show how things have changed in a generation. My father was a B-17 pilot back in the World War II era. So in 1943, 44 timeframe, he was training at a, at a place called Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. Well, on my first space shuttle mission, we took our T-38s down to the Cape for launch and we landed at Maxwell Air Force Base, which is still there, and uh, and went on to the Cape. I can imagine, could somebody, if somebody had tapped my 19-year-old father on the shoulder and say, hey, someday you're gonna have a son and he's gonna land here at this base in a jet which he knew nothing of at that point, on his way to the Kennedy Space Center, he was going to fly in a space shuttle, and it, you know, which was complete science fiction. And if that didn't make him faint, they'd say, oh, and by the way, in his career, he's going to fly with a German astronaut and a Japanese astronaut. Shows you how much times have changed since World War II. And to have that kind of cooperation has been an amazing, amazing thing to experience. That's that's how I felt about landing uh, reusable first stages on rockets until a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that I think brings to mind a question, Rex, what you just brought up that I think people would be curious to know, which is you've all had long and distinguished careers that you've kind of <clears throat> taken us through briefly here. From when you started as ASCANs to now, and then where you think we'll be in 20 years, how has the profession changed and how do you think it's going to change once it's no longer just members of civil space agencies? I think I've seen the most radical change uh, because when I came in in 1980, uh, I was in the second class of people not Apollo astronauts to be, you know, the two years prior, the class of 78 had come in. They, they made world history because that was the first time you had anybody other than a, a white male, uh, with the exception of a couple of scientists, they were all test pilots. And, um, and then shuttle, because it was going to be able to carry up seven, maybe even eight people, as we did on, on, um, on one German space lab mission, uh, shuttle opened the opportunity for people of all races, creeds, colors, background, and everything. You didn't even need to be uh, a STEM-related person, as we proved with, um, with my payload specialist on my first flight, then Congressman Bill Nelson. So what what shuttle did was open up the opportunity to bring on people that axiom today is trying to give an, uh, an opportunity to 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 venture to space and have an opportunity to see and experience the kinds of things that that the you know that the four of us saw and experienced that i can only speak for myself but it changed my life because it changed my whole perspective on the planet and that's one of the things that makes me really uh, anxious to see more and more people get an opportunity to go where we've been. You know, it's interesting that that's obviously an inflection point in their trajectory of democratizing access to space, right? So you go from all white military test pilot males to, you know, what the space shuttle was. And I think we're in the middle of the second transition now, which is to allow non-government astronauts to, to be able to fly. And just a quick story, um, back in 2004 and five, I was training with um, somebody to go to the ISS on the Soyuz. And so I had my Russian counterpart was uh, Mikhail Misha Turin. And then the third seat was going to be occupied by a space flight participant, a, a tourist, if you will. And I wasn't crazy about that idea, I'll be honest. You know, space station was still under construction, and I figured this is for trained professionals, and we're wearing hard hats around here and things like that. And um, at the end of the day, the person who was training for that mission was medically disqualified and was substituted by another person, Anusha Ansari. 
And my time training with her briefly and then flying with her for just about 10 days completely changed my outlook on that. And I started, you know, going from being a, a reluctant uh, participant in this movement of getting people who are not professionals into space to, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid and then pouring the Kool-Aid. You know, Charlie, when you and I were back in our respective roles between 2012 and 2015, so it was interesting times. And I think that that's what I see in the future. Oh, you know, another, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to add that I think probably this time in space exploration is changing a lot and having more and more interest in commercialization of space is going to help the exploration of space because it's going to help us build an infrastructure that will stabilize the industry that will allow us to take the next steps and, and go to the moon and Mars and do these other big things because we will have a an infrastructure built up that's taking advantage of the commercial aspects of space. And as a scientist, I think there's just tons of potential uh, uses uh, for space to do scientific research and develop new drugs and, you know, grow stem cells, et cetera. So I think there's lots of really interesting stuff that can be done up there. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how people are going to take advantage of it and use it more more effectively. If I can go back to your, you know, kind of your question, Bo, I, I just think about uh, L.A. and my relationship. You know, he, um, when, when I was the NASA administrator and uh, in our early years, I was, as, as L.A. will tell you, I was not a big fan of commercial space flight. Uh, in fact, there were people who felt I was, I was an enemy of commercial space flight, and I, I was not at all. I just, I didn't know about it. I, I wasn't sure how I felt about it, I, I, I knew that the promises being made just could not be fulfilled in the time frame that people laid them out. L.A. went off and got himself involved as the doggone head of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. And I have to admit, I've never told him this before. I wonder what the hell had happened to him. You know, okay, <laughs> who, who the hell got into this guy's head and fed him all this crap? And uh, but as we work together more and more, because he'll tell you, I, I came over and spoke to the organization as much as I could and because I was trying to learn. And uh, but the more you learn about all these disparate people and their ideas, I think the more you understand that, one, we don't have the only way to make a cake and uh, that there are a lot of different ways to do this. And the more diversity of thought we have the better off we're going to be. And that's what commercial space represents to me is just the diversity of thought uh, in how we approach the same thing we all want to do. We all want to, we all want to explore and get, get humans back to the moon and on to Mars and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but NASA doesn't have a corner on the market, nor do any of the other national space agencies. And it's going to be some upstart organization that comes around and, and gives us the, just the right idea that pushes us over the top. And I think that's going to come from the commercial sector. Yeah, and I, I think that that partnership is going to be good from both sides. I think, you know, getting other people, democratizing space even more and allowing more and more people to get to space is going to be great. And I think we all we all support that. Uh, but it's also going to be great for the professional astronauts who get the ch chance to see some of the commercial aspects of space when they get up there and see what are you manufacturing in here? And they, they, they see what the, we're able to do in space. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And then the commercial sector can bring on the components that'll be that'll be just uh, absolutely incredible, like the, the Earth Observatory for the Axiom Space Station. When you have a chance to actually get all the way into the Earth Observatory and really look at the Earth, it's going to be an amazing capability. So I think the, the other side, that the, the commercial side is going to contribute is going to be really valuable too. One thing I think I kind of want to put a pin in here is you've all talked about the importance, the importance of more people on orbit, the importance of the moon and Mars. And I find that as a space communicator, I run into people way too often who are the type to say, we have all these problems on Earth. Why do we need to go to space? And, and that sort of line of thought. And so I'm curious to hear from y'all because I just talk about it for a living. You actually <laughs> signed up and went. And as people who've gone, I'm curious to know why you think it matters. You know, you, I, I will venture into what may be dangerous waters here. I, uh, as we were prepping for this, I mentioned um, a, a thing that Victor Glover, Ike, who's getting ready to fly uh, on the Boeing CST-100, well, SpaceX, I take that back. I think Ike is on the, on the next Crew Dragon mission. Is that right? Somebody help me here. Um, but <laughs> it was, 
he was he's a big he's a big social media guy and he was tweeting something about Black Lives Matter. And and he got a, a really irate response that said, hey, why can't you just talk about space? And uh, he said, I would love to, except space is people. And uh, and unless we get the people thing straight, then we can't do space successfully. What I what our job is now, we're all space communicators in, in a way is to help people on Earth understand that it's because of the things that we've been able to do in space, the advances that we've been able to make. I talked about Peggy's experiment. That was way back in in 1994 when we flew that mission. And uh, I, I don't even, my math is bad, so I'm not even going to try to guess how many long years ago that was. But we're still trying to figure out how to do the kinds of things that she was trying to do to make the world better. And, um, and sometimes it's the microgravity environment of space uh, it enables us to do things a lot quicker uh, because the body gets old quicker in space. So we can see things. That, that's not accurate. Dr. Whitson, you can correct me. I, I just say it gets old. It feels old. Um, <laughs> but, but processes occur much quicker in space than they do down here. So um, the value of space is that it helps us to solve a lot of the major problems that we we have been unable to solve down here, which I think will make society much better in the long run. So I think it's absolutely vital. They're, they're both necessary. I, I think it's a, honestly, it's a false choice to have to pick between space exploration and trying to solve the, wor the world's problems on Earth. I mean, it, they are one and the same. And just think of the money that we spend exploring space as an investment, because that ends up getting you know, multiplied significantly by the all the positive effects that it has on humanity, whether it's STEM education or medications or technology advancements. It's really, um, it, it is money very, very well spent. Yeah, and I'd kind of harken back to the the international cooperation aspect of it. I mean, to get com to get countries to cooperate in space, it, it happens naturally because you're in this foreign environment where there's this tiny foothold where humanity is living off the planet. And we're living off the planet as one crew. We got, you know, we may have European, Japanese, Canadian, American astronauts all together working together, and they work as one team. They solve problems together, fix things together, and they live together, and they 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 learn from each other. And the, the amount of cooperation is absolutely amazing. You know, from a intergovernmental standpoint, there's not a lot of whole pl big places that are keeping the United States and Russia together right now. But boy, on the space program, they are. You know, we treat each other like brothers and sisters. Uh, we we really do take care of each other. And when you're sitting up there from that vantage point. You look down at the earth with no borders and you see that, boy, there's a, a, a lot more we have in common than we have differences. When you look at that thin blue line on the edge of the earth, that's the atmosphere, just this tiny sliver. And that's all that keeps us alive. And you see that from space. And when you have a chance to experience that with people from other countries, it forms a bond. And you take that bond, you take that experience back to your countries, and it really does bring us closer together. I think you guys said it all very well. I, I would add that I, I think there's something more of a philosophical thing about exploration and why we do it. I think we have done it forever and it's always, you know, what's over the next mountain, what's what's over across the ocean. Uh, this is just the next ocean. And so I, I think from a philosophical perspective, it's something we're going to do no matter what. And so, uh, it, it's a, a great way to do it because of the side benefits of all the technological advancements that go along with that and the international cooperation. So it's, it's all, to me, a very much a combined thing. You know, I'll kind of piggyback on what Rex talked about, the international thing. Peggy may or may not remember this, but back in 2010, Peggy went with me and Bill Gerstenmeier and we'll be a small team of people uh, over to China, and we visited Beijing, Shanghai, and I always forget way out in the Gobi Desert, their their launch site for human for their human spaceflight program. And um, you know, I I just remember we we had an opportunity. They had just selected their first two female astronauts, whatever they wanted to call them. And and I remember them coming out and, and meeting Peggy, and it was like God. Uh, it's like they were meeting God. You know, <laughs> even in China. They knew who Peggy Whitson was, you know, the, the first woman to be chief of the astronaut office, this this astronaut extraordinaire. And I, I remember just beaming uh, watching this because this is exactly what what I think what you're talking about, Rex, the fact that that we all appreciate each other for the talent and skills that we bring to this thing. And, and we don't look at 
Um, you know, we don't look at what country somebody came from or what race they are or what religion they are. We just get focused on the mission. And, and we pick people that we want to be like. And those two young Chinese women wanted to be like Peggy Whitson. And I was, just, I was sitting there just beaming it. But Peggy, she, she just chilled, you know, it's no big deal. Uh, two, more, two, more, uh, two more disciples here. <laughs> That's not what I think, Charlie. You know that. <laughs> so I'm sure at some point over a career like that, there's, there, goes, there comes a point where you go from being a person to receiving that sort of the hero worship or the, the adulation that astronauts as a, an entity have always gotten, apparently even from other astronauts. So I'm curious about y'all as people, is when that started to become your experience, did it feel weird? How do you adjust? I mean, I'm sure you still feel like the same person inside. So how much of it for you is a job and how much of it is adapting into becoming a different sort of figure? For me, it, it was very unbelievable to try and think of myself as a big role model or anything like that. I just, it, it's hard to swallow. Um, but once you accept that, I think it, it improves your ability to communicate some of what you want people to take away from your experience and uh, allows you to give a better message maybe. I don't know. I, for me, it, it was definitely a big hurdle to get over being that whole idea that, yes, I should be a role model. Yeah, it's interesting, Bo, how you frame the question because, you know, it is very definitely part of your job. And I think the sooner you kind of accept that responsibility and kind of get over yourself, you know, the better you become at it. It becomes a responsibility to try to communicate effectively and be responsive. And, you know, I think all of us have different personalities uh, with respect to how much we like or dislike the spotlight. But if the spotlight's on you, you know, it's time to perform and you need to do the best you can to get, you know, the right message across. So I think we're all, for me, it's an evolution and I'm still not used to it or comfortable with it. I mean, it, it's certainly different than the day that I started being an astronaut, but I, I'm, I'm not, it's not natural quite yet. And I think it's probably true of a lot of us. Charlie, you were administrator, right? So, I mean, you, yeah. I don't know how the astronaut thing you know, was part of that and how much they tried to downplay that or upplay that? I, um, I always get back to the imposter syndrome. I, um, every place I've been or every level I've been, even from being a general in the Marine Corps all the way up to being the NASA administrator, I'm always pinching myself, um, you know, saying, why am I here? You, you know, how the hell did I get here? And it's like you said, L.A., at some point, you know, you, you realize that, OK, there's something that needs to be done here. And I'm here for a purpose. And, and I want to help other people understand that, that I am an ordinary person, just like I think I am. But I've been given an extraordinary opportunity. And um, I think that's where all four of us are. We, we, lived extra we lived ordinary lives until we were given this opportunity to do this extraordinary thing. And, and, and then it becomes incumbent upon us to try to relate that to other people, particularly young kids, and help them understand that they, too, can do the same thing. So um, I, I was always pinching myself as the NASA administrator, but, but I just went ahead and tried to do what, what was required to be done. You know, it's, it's an interesting kind of fame, though, for, for most of us. I know Peggy and, and Charlie, they, people probably recognize you. I mean, and me in L.A., you know, we can go anywhere with, if we're not wearing a flight suit and people wouldn't know who we are, which is great because you can have a certain, certain sort of anonymity. And then it's, it's surprising sometimes you put the flight suit on and you're getting all this attention and it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, and I got some good advice a while back that that uh, somebody said, you know, the, the life on the road when you're doing the public affairs and public relations, when you're wearing the suit, that's not real life. And if you start treating yourself like that's the way you deserve to be treated, uh, it has some very bad effects. And so you just have to remind yourself when you're out there and people are, you know, uh, making a fuss over you that, hey, that's not the that's not the real world. And when you get back home, you got to be the same person. And when you're interacting with people, you got to be the same person. So it's a Fortunately, that we don't have to, you know, like the Hollywood movie star who can't go anywhere. I, I don't know how they would deal with something like that. So this is kind of something that goes on and off at a, at a reasonable rate, which is which makes it a little more easy to handle. The story that made the most impact on me in my in this astronaut life was, um, you know, was getting to know Neil Armstrong uh, for a while before he passed. And 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 he's an incredibly humble guy, um, very 
quiet, um, very confident, but 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 very quiet. And I remember talking about he, he was talking about how much he enjoyed having gone back to the University of Cincinnati and gotten back in the classroom. And he said what he enjoyed the most was standing in front of a lecture hall, you know, standing in front of a bunch of students and looking at 200 faces and realizing that not a single kid of the 200 kids knew him as anything other than Professor Armstrong. They had no clue. Going back to what you said, Rex, they had no clue. You know, they were so far removed, they, they weren't alive when he landed on the moon. And they didn't realize that Professor Armstrong was Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon. And he said that that was perfect for me because I could then focus on teaching my class and trying to influence these kids. And, and I, I just found that absolutely flabbergasted. Yeah, I got to meet him once, too, at the Kennedy Space Center. I was just about to give a, you know, one of those launch guest tours where they take a bunch of people on, on the bus and tour them around the Kennedy Space Center. Before I get on the bus, one of the public affairs persons says, hey, I just want to let you know that Neil Armstrong is going to be on this bus. And I'm going, you got to be kidding me. What, what is, I'm supposed to give a tour to Neil Armstrong? He goes, you know, he's bringing in some of his family, his, probably his grandkids and stuff. He goes, but you can't let anybody know that he's on the bus or they'll mob him and it, it'll ruin it for him. And so, of course, I was wearing my blue flight suit, so everybody knew I was an astronaut, and uh, I tried to make a fuss about it. He came up, and just like you said, Charlie, he was the most genuine, nice person you'd ever want to meet. And uh, so the tour went great, and there was one point, though, where a lady was going to take a picture of me since I was in my flight suit, and she waited because somebody was in the way. And the person in the way was Neil Armstrong. And so she waits till he gets out of the way to take a picture. And, and I just was, I could tell you, lady, you don't want a picture of me, you want a picture of me. I didn't say anything, but it was really funny. But he's, like I say, just a really humble guy. That's funny. <laughs> I had uh, an interesting experience with him. You know, he came to, I want to say it was Alan Shepard died, you know, in the mid to late 90s. And they had a, a reception or some sort of an event for him in building nine. Um, and this is at Johnson Space Center. And, you know, there it was the astronaut office was invited and their spouses or whatever. And it was kind of, you know, there's a lot of mock ups around. And so they had these corridors where you could walk and everything is sort of roped off. So it was kind of tight quarters in some spaces. So um, I was there with my, my wife at the time and she stepped back from a conversation and inadvertently stepped on Neil Armstrong's foot. <laughs> and I said, you know, you just have a 50-50 chance of having stepped on the first foot that stepped on the <laughs> 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 that's, that's amazing. It, it makes me wonder, you know, for y'all, I wonder if meeting Neil Armstrong, given that he sort of was the paragon of the profession you were in, it, it feels to me like it would be for me to meet Carl Sagan or something like that. Was it like that for y'all or is it more, does the astronaut family sort of transcend time in that way that it was, it was more respect than awe or... I'm just wondering. It seems so fascinating. For me, it was it was it was a little bit of awe, and uh, it just it, like the kind of imposter syndrome that uh, that Charlie talked about. You, you think this can't be real? I can't be considered as part of this line of people who've flown in space. And the same thing happened when when John Glenn got his flight his, on a shuttle flight. Um, Peggy, I don't know if you remember, we were down at the Kennedy Space Center as astronaut candidates. And uh, he came and and was on the same stage as we had a, a function that night, and. He was the member of, you know, the uh, the first class of astronauts, and we were a member of the, uh, you know, the, the sardines, the 16th class. And uh, I, I remember sitting on that stage thinking, I can't believe I'm part of this lineage of astronauts from the first to the brand new. It was just, it, it was just kind of one of those pinch me moments. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, I definitely know that uh, Neil was my inspiration for wanting to become an astronaut because. I remember wa watching on TV when he stepped on the moon, and I think it was a, a very inspirational time in my life. You know, I, I actually enjoy talking to young people that are about eight to twelve because, to me, that's that time frame when they're most receptive to ideas and influences. And that was when I saw Neo walk on the moon, and I was like, "Looks like a cool job to me." <laughs> it is. <laughs> people that are um, that are examples that you want to follow. Uh, you know, we all pick um, 
we all pick role models or people that we would like to be like. And I, I can remember my first year in the astronaut office. In fact, we, we got there in July of 1980 and uh, we were introduced to, to Alby. Alan Bean was, you know, one of the moonwalkers and he was our dende. And so for one whole year during our astronaut candidacy, the guy that rode the buses with us and, you know, and, and, and sat in the back of things with us and everything was, was a moonwalker, was Alan Bean. And this guy was, again, so humble, um, talked about anything you wanted to talk, talk about, answered any questions you wanted to answer, but he was there to help get you through this first, uh, for, for many of us, difficult hurdle of getting out of being an astronaut candidate to being recognized as somebody who's finished the training and is now ready to be assigned to space flight. And, and, and it never ended with him. I remember talking to him um, just, just prior to his death, and he he was a phenomenal artist. If you did not see him, so uh, his 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 artwork is just unbelievable. But I called because we were trying to get him to come to the Naval Academy to participate in something that LA and I have done a number of times called the Astronaut Convocation, where we bring some Naval Academy graduates back to talk to the midshipmen about the space program. And we were looking for a moonwalker because we wanted to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Apollo, and and we couldn't find one that wanted to come. So. I called Al Bean and he said, you know, I am honored, particularly as a University of Texas alum. Uh, we, you know, we, I would love to come back there to do that. He said, but, you know, I don't have much time left and I've got too much work to do. He, wanted, he had a couple of more lunar landscapes that he wanted to paint. And he recognized the fact that that's what his life was now dedicated to. So, you know, again, he gave me this example of you may have loved flying in space, but there's now something else that you really need to focus on that's going to give a message to people here on Earth and help help bring other people along. And that for him, it was the choice of art. And I talk about that mainly, Bo, because you're a space communicator and it, you do something very well that a lot of us work really hard to do. And that's tell a story, communicate, uh, make things understandable to people. You do it as second nature. We really I can't again, I can only speak for myself. I really work hard at it because you want to talk in acronyms and you want to talk in stuff that, that you've learned and the common man and woman on the street doesn't have a clue what, what you're talking about. So, um, you know, there is a really important place for communicators in helping us to tell the story of what we're passionate about and what we do. Well, you know, for me, it I had my own journey to get here that was sort of influenced by the, the feeling that this was going to be my life's work. but. In this context, you know, you've all been, and that's the thing that is so amazing. And and so to pick up on the point you were making, Charlie, I I I am considering myself sort of the avatar in this case for the viewer, for somebody who who had the honor to meet y'all and would just have all these questions and the kind of stuff that you don't get to say in interviews or in press appearances, but just how you really feel as a person, you know. And and so the thing that I have never asked all y'all, even when I've seen you face to face, but I think about all the time is, you know, Charlie, you talked about flying being a life changing experience for you. And Rex talked about it being eye opening in terms of international relations. But I would, if you're willing, I would like to hear from each of you just briefly what it really was like. I mean, really, you know, we talk about the overview effect and we talk about the absence of national borders and the thinness of the atmosphere, but on a personal subjective level, what that experience was like for you? For me personally, I, I, I think it gives you perspective. Uh, you look down at the earth and at, you know all of humanity, except for this handful of people that was living up on the space station with you, lived there. And you recognize how important that place is and it's so big, you know, you realize how big it is and you, you have no idea, I think, until you step away and see how big it is and how important it is for all of us to have that. And so you have that sense of perspective. And then you look out to the stars and you have, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of stars. And that's just in our galaxy. And there's billions and billions of galaxies. And to me, that that range of perspective that you get gives you this huge sense of how important we are and how little, of, you know, less than a grain of sand on a beach that we are. Uh, so it's this really interesting sense of perspective for me that uh, I really felt very changed by the experience. 
I think one thing that sticks out for me is just the launch experience. Uh, it, it's it's absolutely amazing to to be a part of a launch where you're catapulting humans off the face of the planet into orbit. And to, and you know if you're an adrenaline junkie like a lot of us are, you know, and like to you know like flying jets and doing all these kinds of things, a ride on us on a rocket is absolutely amazing. And it's hard to explain the sheer acceleration, but when you're when you're going Mach 15, 15 times the speed of sound, and you're still accelerating like you're getting shot out of a cannon, it's an absolutely amazing experience. I remember one of the launches, one of the pilot commander at this point turns around and says, says, we are really hauling the mail. And there was no question about it. You are getting shot off the planet. So you're going someplace really fast. So it's an amazing experience. You know, I think we're all... Um technically minded people and we go through an awful lot of training you know before we fly and so we ought to be ready for what that launch experience is like and we ought to be ready for the view out the earth and when you get there despite all the training and despite sort of knowing exactly what it's supposed to feel like you just can't believe it i mean it is so otherworldly and and the the crime in a way is I can't touch that experience right now. It's It lives in a parallel universe. I know I was there. I have pictures and videos and all that, but I can't feel that. And um, and you kind of miss it. I mean, it's really an amazing um, life altering. Not, night, not, not kind of, you definitely miss it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, the only thing I would add to what everybody else has said, it, it, you know, as Peggy said, it really changes your perspective on the planet. And um, every all of these folk know that I'm a very emotional person, and and I sh I show my emotions all the time. I I'll start weeping on you, and people look going, "There's something wrong with that guy." I thought they said that he was a general in the Marine Corps. Yeah, why is he crying? But but it was like that on my first flight. You know, it it's like I guess about 15 minutes, and you you know, 15 minutes ago you were laying there half asleep on the launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center, and, and now you're passing over the British Isles. And, and in my case, because we had launched due east, I looked out the window and I saw this big island, at least I thought it was a big island, and it turned out to be the continent of Africa. And for me, uh, because I had spent a lot of time studying the geography of Africa as a person of African descent, because I thought I'd have an opportunity to kind of look at some of the countries from which my ancestors may have come. And I was ready to, you know, to see what Senegal looked like and what Nigeria looked like and all this other stuff. And I looked at this beautiful island that turned out to be the second biggest continent on the planet. And there were no lines and no borders. And I don't know why I really expected it to look like a globe, but it didn't. And all the way from the Mediterranean coast, just going through the Sahara Desert down to the equatorial regions and I mean, it was breathtaking and I literally wept. I, I literally, tears came to my eyes. One, because as Peggy said a while back, I realized how insignificant I was. Uh, you know, that there was, I couldn't tell, there were no signs of people down there except for roads and bridges and long linear things you can see, but you can't see buildings and you definitely do not see people. And, and then it, it makes you step back and wonder, boy, how awesome is this to be here looking down on this place that we call home and a lot of things I thought about it, a lot of things I was taught about it, about differences in people and differences in countries and borders and boundaries and that's all bunk. You know, it's all stuff that's in my head because somebody taught me that. Uh, so that that was that was the emotional thing that LA's talking about that I wasn't prepared for. And, and I mean, it just emotionally affected me. And it, and it did every single time I went to space. I never got a, I never got a custom to that, to being off the planet um, in a unique situation that very, very, very few people have an opportunity to do. It seems to me like you'd all go back. If you yep. could. In a heartbeat. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the so plan. <laughs> we, <laughs> we all, we, those of us who think in very long terms about the future of all this, you know, whether you're talking about colonies on Mars or the moon, you're talking about O'Neill cylinders or or future Axiom space stations all over Leo and and maybe further, you know, you think about a, per, a truly permanent human presence in space, people who maybe even are born, live and die there on a long enough time scale. So I guess my last curiosity to ask y'all is if you had that choice, if you could live 
the rest of your time in space somewhere, let's say we could simulate gravity or back on Earth, which would you choose? I'd be right here. I I'm would like to eat, Charlie. Hey, let me I tell would, you, I'd be here with my three, I, nothing, no experience I've had replaces the, the, the incredible joy um, that I get looking into the eyes of my three beautiful granddaughters and, and, uh, and telling them about people like Peggy and seriously, you know, um, and saying, you know, you can be like her, knowing that they can now. Uh, that wasn't always the case. You know, when Peggy came along, I'm not sure that she had any belief that she could do what she's done right now. Nobody ever thought we'd have a, a female chief of the astronaut office, as an example. Not when I got there. That was that was out of the question. You, you were not going to have a non-military test pilot ever lead the astronaut office. Yeah, I would agree with those guys too. I think what makes space so magical is being able to go there back and forth. I think, you know, it's going to be great one day when people can live there permanently, but it's it's just such a transformative experience. And it really it really has its full meaning when you've been there and come back and share it with people and think back on it and then maybe get a chance to go again. So the more we can go back and forth, the more uh, the more ability to have that kind of transformative experience, I think, is, is really beneficial. My only problem is I have to get my husband to be an astronaut, too, so he can go with, and then we'll just stay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> well, it looks like we're hitting the end of our time here. I, this has been such an amazing conversation, and I'm sure I could listen to y'all do it for hours. So I hope that we get the chance to do it again soon. Thank you all for your time. L.A., Peggy, Rex, Charlie, everyone watching, be well. Until then. All right. Take care.